Um, I've always been a bit of a loner. Uh, I can't begin to describe to you how terrifying this is. Uh, growing up in a big city like Taipei, I wasn't thrilled about all the people. So when my parents took me to visit the old Taipei City Observatory as a young child, and I learned that I can study the night sky for a living, I was instantly hooked. My goal? To find aliens. <laughs> Seriously. I was pretty sure astronomers just weren't looking at the right places. Luckily, that dream has let me hear the floor stay, and I am now myself an astronomer. In case you're wondering, and I know you're wondering, I have not found any aliens yet. <laughs> well, more recently, I've been volunteering at my son's school to try to explain the universe bit by bit to a room full of eight-year-olds. I remember blurting out, did you know we can turn telescopes into time machines? But we'll cover that next time. Boy, that did not go over well. <laughs> How? What do you mean? Tell us now, the angry mob demanded. <laughs> Everyone loves a story about time machines, especially about ones that work. I want to tell you that story. I want to tell you the story of how astronomers turn telescopes into literal time machines and discover one of the universe's greatest secrets. Now today, we know the universe is a pretty big place, but we have only become aware of its true scale relatively recently in our history. Let me walk you through this. Now, astronomy is as old as any ancient civilization, but let's fast forward to the year 1543. By this time, the idea that we, or the Earth, is at the center of the universe has stood for more than 1,000 years. This astronomer, Nicholas Copernicus, courageously defied this worldview and proposed that the sun, rather than the Earth, is at the center. Fast forward to the year 1920, Harlow Shapley took the next step and removed the sun from the center of the universe. Just a few years after that, Edwin Hubble showed that even our enormous galaxy, the Milky Way, is just one of many. Over and over, our observations prove that we're nothing special. We're just ordinary citizens of the universe. Our vantage point is an ordinary one. We do not occupy a special place. This is what we call the Copernican Principle, named after Copernicus, who started all this. Now, also around this time, Albert Einstein was developing a theory of gravity. The result was one of the most elegant and successful theories of all time, general relativity. Einstein's equation gave us a framework to describe the universe as a whole. This equation also results in a dynamic universe, one that changes its size over time. Now, Einstein did not like this outcome, and he preferred a static universe. So today, we can guess that his preference for a static universe may have been based on the Copernican principle. After all, if we do not occupy a special place, why should we occupy a special time? The only way to keep the present time absolutely ordinary is to have a static and forever unchanging universe. Now, how do we even make sense of the universe? A lot of what we understand today begins with measuring distances. Measuring distances is actually a pretty good job description of what I do. Now, how do we even go about measuring the distance to a star or a galaxy? The first important method is called parallax, or as most of us know it, depth perception. OK, so this is an experiment we can all do together. So let's hold one finger up in front of our eyes, look at the finger with one eye, then the other, then blink back and forth and back and forth. I know this looks silly, but we're all looking silly together. <laughs> OK, so what do you notice? Your finger appears to move even though you're not moving it. Now we can repeat the experiment by placing your finger closer or farther. Then 
you will notice that this apparent movement is larger when your finger is closer and smaller when your finger is farther. This is the exact principle astronomers use to determine distances to nearby stars. Except, instead of the separation of the eyes, we use orbits around the sun to do the triangulation. To go beyond our galaxy, Henrietta Swan Leavitt devised a clever technique to go farther using bright and pulsating stars. Now, the foundation of modern astronomy were built by female astronomers like Henrietta Swan Leavitt, but that's a story for another time. Besides distance, we can also measure the velocity of a star or a galaxy. Now, we have all had the experience of having a fire truck driving toward us with the sirens blaring, hopefully not driven by these guys. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so you hear the higher pitch as the fire truck drives toward you, and the pitch lowers as it drives away. As it turns out, light also has wave-like properties, just like sound wave from a fire truck. This pitch, or the frequency of light, from a galaxy, it's high if the galaxy is coming toward us, and low if the galaxy is moving away. So when astronomers went to measure this pitch of light from galaxies, they noticed something really curious. Almost all galaxies have low pitch, meaning that not only are these galaxies moving at incredible speeds relative to us, they're all moving away. Combining with distance information, astronomers learn that the farther a galaxy, the faster it is moving away. Now, the Copernican principle tells us that we, our vantage point is an ordinary one. So any random alien would observe the same effect from wherever she is. Then the universe must be expanding at it from every perspective and not at all static, as Einstein once believed. So this, is, this brings us to our amazing time machine. Can we go even farther into the cosmos than death perception or pulsating stars can take us? The answer is yes, thanks to a special kind of exploding stars. Type 1a supernovae are the violent ends of some low-mass stars that live in multi-star systems. These explosions are so uniform that they work like light bulbs. So if I observe a bunch of 10-watt light bulbs, I know the fainter ones are, the far, uh, are farther away. But more importantly, these supernovae are super bright. The explosion of one single star can produce light that rivals that of an entire galaxy. Because they're so bright, we can reach Distance is so large that we're turning telescopes into time machines. <laughs> the image, yes, the image of this unassuming supernova was taken only a couple decades ago. But the supernova itself exploded over billions of years ago. The life from this explosion left its galaxy and traveled billions of light years in order to reach us here at the present time. So when we're studying this very ancient light from this very distant supernova, we're really going back in time to see how the universe was all those billions of years ago. The farther in distance we look, the further back in time we go. Space and time are inseparable. So by observing supernovae at different distances, we're really recording the history of the universe. So in the 1980s and 90s, two teams of astronomers set out to do exactly that. Now we know the universe is expanding, and we also know that the universe is full of stuff that wants to bring everything back together through gravity. So naturally, astronomers fully expected to be measuring 
the slowing down of the expansion. This is like if I throw a ball up in the air, I would expect the ball to slow down. But of course, we know astronomy is always full of surprises. Remember that from distant supernovae to nearby supernovae, we're watching the movie of the universe playing forward in time. And this movie tells us that, yes, the expansion did slow down at some point in the distant past. But today, that expansion is speeding up. This is like if I throw a ball up in the air, it, the ball did slow down as expected. But then it continues to go upward toward the sky with faster and faster speed. You can imagine the shock these astronomers had. We only trusted the result because two rival teams came to the same conclusion. This unknown cause for this accelerated expansion is the dark energy because we still have no idea what it is. We do not know what dark energy is, but we know how much there is. If we count up the matter energy content of the entire universe, dark energy accounts for roughly two thirds. Over 95% of the universe is unknown to us. Literally everything we know, you and I, the chairs you're sitting in, the light in this room, the most exotic celestial objects observed, the most exotic subatomic particles measured, all belong in this thin slice of pie. Now, there are many fantastic theories as to what dark energy may be. Um, it may come from the collective growth of all the black holes in our expanding universe. It may be the potential energy provided by a neighboring parallel universe. Whatever it may be, the effect on our future is clear. It will be bleak. One day in the future, the light from our neighboring galaxies will reach us here, and then no more. So ominous, right? <laughs> but, but don't worry, this won't happen for a few billion years. So you have time. It is not until my speaker coaches asked me, what could all this mean for us, that I began to reflect on this crazy result. The Copernican principle tells us that we're nothing special. Our solar system is one in 100 billion in our galaxy. Our galaxy is one in 100 billion in our universe. Heck, our universe may even be one of many parallel universes. Indeed, astronomy can often make us feel utterly insignificant. But let's take a moment to think about a different perspective that the discovery of dark energy offers. First, consider what we are. The universe is mostly composed of dark energy and dark matter. As far as we know, only the stuff in this thin slice of pie is capable of producing complex molecules, replicating cells, and intelligent life. Second, consider when we are. Indeed, we, we do live in a unique time in the history of our universe, one that still allows life from distant, distant galaxies to reach us so that we can study the past and predict the future. As much as I spend a great deal of effort to avoid people, um, I have come to appreciate that we are literal miracles who live in miraculous times. Through this particular arrangement of complex molecules, we develop logical thought, sci the scientific method, and arrived at this, although incomplete, understanding of the universe. To me, that is a miracle. Don't get me wrong, I'm still going to plan my route to my office just to avoid small talk. <laughs> Indeed, we are a way for the universe to know itself. We, along with our fellow aliens, of course, are the unique few who can exist and exist at the right time to explore the world. We will all have our own way of building our own understanding of the world. It does not matter how you do it, it just matters that you do it. Let's seize on that. 
And thank you for being the center of my universe for the past few minutes.